What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with another video. Today we'll be going over your picks as the 10 must own players this season. We asked you guys to give us your favorite picks at each position and today I will go over that list giving my take on the players you selected. As always, if you want my most up-to-date take on every single player along with their values, risk grades, projections, what draft slump you should be picking, and a whole lot more. You can see all of that at our website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com. So, we'll go over this list in a second, but first, I have to start things off as usual. It's out of the day. Yesterday's stat was how many quarterbacks had a game last season with at least 35 fantasy points. The answer is 10. Ren Reganaldo was the first to get that right on YouTube, and at Nate Trotter 4 was the first to get that right on Twitter. Today's stat. What running back had the most receiving yards from week nine on last season? All right, so I'm going to go position by position here, and we're going to start off with quarterback, where I have three names for you guys. Kyler Murray, Josh Allen, Ryan Tannehill. It was a virtual tie for all three, so there's no real order here. With some of these positions, we're going to have uh, kind of like a top tier, second tier, but Murray, Allen, Tannehill... All got pretty much the same votes. You guys liked all of these guys the most. And for this take, I'm in complete agreement. And it follows, you know, our general strategy at quarterback this season. We really do want one of the top five or six quarterbacks, but Mahomes does usually cost, you know, a lot. He's the most expensive of the grouping, so maybe we pass on him. Dak is a little banged up right now. Lamar has missed you know, a good amount of camp, so he hasn't really been getting a ton of hype. I don't really think that's going to impact him this season, but it's at least something that might have people off of him. But Kyler and Josh Allen, you know, they're two that we're very, very excited about. We know they're going to be on exceptional offenses. We know both of them have upside, both through the air and on the ground. And we know that both these guys are going to have a very large share of their team's offensive touchdowns. These are two quarterbacks that we're for sure targeting in that like fourth and fifth round range. Although of course we prefer to get players always as late as possible. And there are two players that the projections agree with us on. As of recording this, both are projected to be worth about late third to early fourth round picks. It depends on your scoring format. Uh, but in general, across most formats, they're like late third to early fourth round picks. So the projections agree they're really, really good picks where they're going. So I'm 100% on board with you guys with this one. As for Tannehill, I'm very glad you guys voted for him as well. I actually went over him in yesterday's video, but that's not released yet for me. So as of recording this, you know, when I was gathering your guys' responses for who you guys like the most, my take on Tannehill being very, very undervalued hadn't been released yet. So that didn't influence uh, this at all. The basic premise, though, for those of you who, I guess, didn't watch yesterday's video, I mean, Tannehill, he's been very, very good, and it's like people, I don't know if they don't want to admit it because he was like, he wasn't great, um, he wasn't like a huge prospect at quarterback, then he wasn't great on Miami because, you know, that was a time where like no one was ever good on Miami, leaves Miami, and then he joins the Titans. I believe he joins the Titans. I could definitely be wrong on this one. When Mariota was initially the quarterback and then Tannehill takes over from Mariota, but there was never any hype going into Tannehill. And then he performed pretty well. You know, it's also not a high volume offense. And so um, to start out, maybe those numbers were insane. And then he, he has like that season, maybe like two years ago, where he was this fantastic streaming option down the stretch of the season. And everyone was like, well, that's probably not going to continue. And then it sort of did. You know, I'll show the graphic again uh, from what Scott Barrett tweeted out because it's honestly insane. Again, Ryan Tannehill has been extremely comparable to Patrick Mahomes over his last 24 games played. He has fewer pass attempts and thus fewer yards. But honestly, he has the edge in touchdowns, passer rating, yards per attempt, air yards per attempt, fantasy points per drop back, PFF grade. They're tied in interceptions, and Mahomes has a lead in fantasy points per game, but it's by 0.6 points per game. Tannehill's been fantastic. And now he adds Julio Jones, which is 
such a massive upgrade over Corey Davis. Corey Davis is a player we know is a number two. He's not a true number one, which was fine on the Titans. They didn't need him to be a number one. Now they have two. They've got A.J. Brown. They've got Julio Jones. They have two clear number ones. As of recording this, I have him as the 10th quarterback off the board, early ninth round value grade. He'll absolutely remain a target this season unless someone gets hurt or he gets hurt, but I, I love it. I mean, if you miss out on this first tier, Tannehill and Stafford, for me, are two of the guys that I'm going after. Used to be Burrow. I think I tweeted something out. I am docking Burrow's projection a little bit. Things don't look that great out of camp, um, but Tannehill. Tannehill's the guy that I want if I missed out on those elite quarterbacks, and I'm glad you guys agree. On to wide receivers, where you guys selected CeeDee Lamb by a mile. Like, he had maybe twice as many responses as any other player. You guys are in love with CeeDee Lamb, so he's first. And then second place for you guys was Devonta Adams. After that, the responses were very, very spread out. Basically, everyone got like even amounts, and so I didn't think that there was really a player that was like jumping out as third. So Lamb first, Adams second. And what do you know? You know, I agree. And obviously, I'm going to agree with probably most of these. There is one that you guys had that I don't fully agree with. But let's be honest. You guys watch my content. You're probably going to like similar players to me. But it's nice knowing that the people that you're most excited about, I'm also excited about as well. But as for Lamb, like I actually said in yesterday's video, we do need to watch this DAC injury, right? Anything involving the shoulder is obviously concerning. He was already returning from the major leg injury. The most likely outcome to me still is that he's totally fine in week one. They're just going to let him rest during this um, the summer period. They're not going to push him. They're going to be very cautious and make sure he's good to go in week one because the preseason just does not matter. But until we get news that confirms that, Yes, there's a, there's a small amount of risk. I'm still assuming like maybe he's 99, 98%, but until we get news that confirms either direction, it's an unknown, of course. For Lamb, though, I mean, he's been crushing camp. You know, he had a fantastic rookie season. He's probably going to be fantastic this season. Again, I just did an in-depth breakdown on him as part of yesterday's video, so I don't want to do another in-depth breakdown on him. I will link that in the description box um, so you guys can check on a, a longer take there. But I think everyone understands why he's such a good pick. You know, everyone knows that he's an elite talent. Everyone knows that, again, assuming Dak's good to go, this is an elite offense. This is a very high volume offense. So not only will there be touchdowns and yardage, but the reception totals can get really, really high. We know that these spiked weeks will be there because... Dallas is definitely going to be playing in multiple shootouts. We know that he's going to catch long touchdowns. He's going to make big plays. Like, he wasn't even a full-time player last season, and he was still really, really good as a rookie. I believe that this season, CeeDee Lamb will uh, rise in, I guess, the depth chart of Dallas. He will be their number one. He will overtake Amari Cooper. And if I think that's going to happen, yeah, I think he's a really, really good pick in, like, that mid-third round range where he's going right now. Your other selection... Adams, I probably don't need to sell you on Devonta Adams being a really good player, but I think it's worth mentioning that not everyone has him as the number one wide receiver. There are multiple major platforms that have him ranked as the wide receiver two, the wide receiver three, and I'm not talking about like ESPN, Yahoo, like drafting platforms. I'm saying like fantasy content creators. There are major platforms out there that do not have him at one do not even have him at two. To me, that seems a little bit silly. Like, I honestly think that he's just a surefire wide receiver one this season. He's coming off 115 for 1,374 yards and 18 touchdowns through effectively 13 and a half weeks. And everyone knows this is going to be Rodgers' last season in Green Bay. If you don't think that Aaron Rodgers wants to break records this season, especially with being 17 weeks or 17 games, I guess, 18 weeks, like you're out of your mind. They bring back Cobb, they bring in Amari Rodgers, so maybe people are concerned about that, but Adams is so much better than those two. Like I know Amari Rodgers is a good prospect. I know that 
Aaron Rodgers likes Randall Cobb, so he's going to use him. But Adams is so clearly their number one that it doesn't matter. 96th percentile success rate versus the man last season. 95th percentile success rate versus the press. The ability to pair Aaron Rodgers with that is honestly unfair. He should be the number one wide receiver. He should be worth a mid first round pick. Regardless of the format, it literally doesn't matter what your scoring format is. If you want to see exactly where he is on your scoring format, again, like I don't, I mean, he's different. Like literally, if you're playing in PPR, half PPR, you're in super flex, you're in standard, like all those combinations, it's going to be different. He's not going to be the exact same pick in all of those formats. So he's a mid first round pick. But if you want to see exactly where he is for your format, check it out on the website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com. On to the tight ends, where we have a number of players that come in with very similar vote totals. So at the top, it was Waller and Kittle. That's no surprise. I've talked a lot about how we really want one of these elite tight ends, but it's not always possible to get Kelsey. There's only a few specific picks you have to be in to get Travis Kelsey. But, you know, there's there's a number of picks you can make uh, and get Darren Waller, get Kittle. It kind of expands to basically like half the draft. I would say like one through seven, you might, maybe not the seven pick, but one through six, one through seven, you at least have an opportunity to take one of Darren Waller or Kittle. So I understand why you guys have them. And then tied for, I guess, third is Kelsey, of course, because he's going to dominate. And then Hawkinson. So let's start off with basically the only player in this video that I personally do not agree with, and that's Hawkinson. Every single day, that's not an exaggeration, I see people saying that, like, ooh, you know, we're trying to, because everyone wants to find a breakout on teams where players aren't getting hyped that much, I guess, besides Hawkinson. They're always like, oh, you know, Goff loves his slot receivers, so you got to look at Amon or St. Brown. Or, oh, they have no good receivers, and so Swift is obviously going to go off. Or same reasoning for Jamal Williams is obviously going to go off. Or they have no receivers, so Hawkinson's obviously going to go off. When you start doing that, you get into a situation where now obviously every single player on Detroit is going to go off. Okay, but the reality is that this is not going to be a good team. The reality is that even though you can say maybe they are forced to lean more pass heavy, that's not necessarily a good thing. Okay, we can say that with Atlanta last season, with Dallas last season when they were going off because they had elite offenses. But if a team is always trailing because their offense can't score, that's not good, okay? And while they don't have big names at wide receiver, they're still going to use Williams, Perriman, and St. Brown a lot. And so it's not like they're going to be lining up plays where it's like, oh, look, at their receivers are Swift, Jamal Williams, and, and Hawkinson, right? And Hawkinson's getting every single target. He's still going to earn these targets. They're still going to throw to wide receivers. And again, they're not going to be very good. So I understand the appeal of Hawkinson as a nice breakout, but I think the hype is going a little bit too far. He costs you a fifth round pick, which is a little bit concerning to me because you're putting yourself in a pretty big hole if Hawkinson doesn't work out there. Um, There are really, really good wide receivers, fantastic quarterbacks still on the board. And so for you to take Hawkinson instead of those players, well, now he better break out. And then when you consider that, like, Kittle and Waller are third-round picks, and you're probably taking Pitts, who definitely has more upside in, like, the fourth, fifth round, it's like, you're not that far removed from options that are much, much, much better. And when you consider what you can get five, six, seven rounds later are players who are not as good, but not that far off from Hawkinson, it's just, like, a weird value range where I just can't see myself making the pick. If you're in a league where people aren't hyping him up as much and he falls into the seventh, into the eighth round, like obviously then attack that because, yeah, he could be their best receiver. But in competitive leagues, he's been going in like the fifth, maybe into the sixth round, but not past the sixth round. And to me, that's just like a little bit too early to consider a must own. For, for him to be in a must own player, I think the value has to be really, really good. And I don't see it. I think there are multiple other tight ends that the value is much, much better than with Hawkinson. But again, I do agree with Kelsey. I agree with Waller and I agree with Kittle. If you've got a late first round pick, Kelsey is 
so valuable because he provides so many points above replacement and even above the second and third options. And if you miss out on that, well, Waller and Kittle are like the only two that you have a chance of pushing Kelsey for that number one spot. And we just know they're going to be very, very good this season. So I also agree. They're good picks. I just don't agree with Hawkinson. Last but not least, we have the running back position where it's Najee Harris and Zeke first with David Montgomery sliding into the third spot. I'm actually a little bit surprised that you guys picked Ezekiel Elliott. I think he's a really good pick, but I guess I didn't think you guys liked him as much as you do. Of course, there's the same caveat here as there was with C.D. Lamb. Zeke is obviously going to lose value if you know this Jack injury turns out to be worse than we think. If he's not, you know, 100% recovered from the leg, like there are factors to where obviously Zeke could be a downgrade, but assuming that Dak is good to go, you are getting, you know, a workhorse back with a secure goal line role on a top three offense who maybe can't be considered like a three down back as Pollard's going to play, but he's still going to have reception. So he's, he's going to be contributing in every area. There was a report a week ago that I want to go over that said Tony Pollard might mix in more this season in an effort to keep Ezekiel Elliott healthy for the playoffs. To me, that quote doesn't mean like a whole lot. Of course, they're going to try and keep the playoffs in mind. Every single team in the NFL is doing that, but they're not a lock to win the division, right? Like the Giants are not a real threat. The Eagles are definitely not favorites. I'll say that they're a Rhett. They could have a good season uh, if Devonta Smith can come back healthy, if Jalen Hurts can end up being really good. But if we're looking at the favorites to win this division, it's obviously Dallas and the football team, right? But the football team's really good. And so for Dallas to enter the season, you know, and even in the first like two months of the season, and to be like, yeah, you know, we're saving Zeke for the playoffs, okay, you might not make the playoffs. That's a reality for Dallas this season is that they might not make the playoffs. So they're not sitting there, you know, in the, the third, the fourth quarter being like, well, you know, we would love to use Elliott this series, but we're keeping him fresh for the playoffs. Like, unless they're starting off really, really hot and Washington's not starting off good, they're going to realize that, like, they have to make the playoffs first. And then they can start thinking about resting players and keeping players fresh. And so maybe he sees a slight reduction from last season, but it's by like one, maybe two touches a week. He's getting all the goal line. He's getting receptions. He's getting early down workload. He's going to be good. He's going to get a ton of touches. They're not going to split the work 50-50 with Tony Pollard. After Zeke, we have Najee Harris and David Montgomery. The industry seems to be backing off Harris, so I'm glad you guys picked him. He's down to 21st in ADP on underdog. He's ranked in like the upper teens between like 18 and 20, I would say, on most of the major platforms. As of recording this, I do still have him as like an early to mid second round pick in pretty much every format. And it's actually pretty difficult for him to drop too much further in the projections. He's kind of secure in that spot. I just, I don't really get why his ADP is dropping so much. Like, I can see not being in the first round, but I, I cannot see being, you know, in the late second round. Like, their GM literally just said that he'd be disappointed if Harris wasn't a three-down back. Like, they drafted him under the assumption he's going to be featured. You don't spend a first-round pick on Najee Harris when you have no talent at running back or no consistent talent, no real talent. And like not feature him. He's going to be featured. He's going to get all the touches he can handle with a lot of those coming in the receiving game. I think a lot of people are concerned about the offensive line and they use that way too much. It is so overused being concerned about offensive lines. Yes, maybe with um, the Colts. Maybe you can use with the Colts. Nelson gets hurt. He's going to miss some time. He's a very, very good offensive lineman. If you want to dock uh, Jonathan Taylor like 1% to 2% in his projection, I'm on board with that. But understand that that's only dropping him like four total points, okay? And understand that one play can make up for that. 
And so when people are, are hyping up players because of the offensive line or they're downgrading players because of the offensive line, it's a little bit ridiculous at times because I, I've said this before, I don't care about the carries for Najee Harris. That's not why I, I'm drafting him. I don't care if the offensive line would have had him have like 4.9 yards per carry, but now he's only going to have 4.5. Like I don't care. That's not where production comes from in fantasy. Production comes from touchdowns and receptions. That's how you score fantasy points. Even in standard scoring formats, you want those touchdowns. And since we know for a fact that Harris is going to have a ton of touchdowns, he's going to have a ton of receptions, whatever scoring format you're in, that's awesome. You don't really care if he's going to have, you know, 1,100 or 1,025 rushing yards. Like that, that's not going to be what makes the difference. What makes the difference is, is he getting the touches in the receiving game? And is he getting the touches at the goal line? And I believe the answer to both of those is yes. And so he's a great pick where he's going. So I agree with you guys. Final player, Dave Montgomery. Uh, He remains criminally undervalued again this season. Everyone hates Montgomery. I don't understand it. Dude was like fourth in points per game from week four or five on last season. Cohen is looking very unlikely for week one. If he is somehow out there in week one, it'll be an extremely limited role. I would not be surprised if he like just straight misses games to start the season. Yes, they have Damian Williams. Yes, they will use him in the receiving game, but they're also going to use Montgomery. He's going to get a ton of everything we just talked about uh, with why we want players in fantasy. A ton of goal line touches, a ton of carries, and he's going to still get plenty of receptions. And He doesn't go in the second round. He is dropping really far. You can get him in the fourth round on underdog. You can get him in the late third round on Yahoo!, on NFL, like, he's going late. He's not going that early. And so the ability to pair him with another elite running back and an elite wide receiver or two, I mean, an underdog, you can literally get him if you took, like, a top, uh, let's say, you can honestly take a running back in the first round, two stud wide receivers, and then you get Dave Montgomery in the fourth round, that's a little bit unfair of a start. You know, him as your running back, too, with also elite wide receivers, that is a ton of upside. And since we're so certain that he's going to be good this season, I think it's a very, very strong way to start your draft. So those are definitely more than 10. I want to say it was 11. Maybe it was 12, but I want to say it was like 11, kind of thinking back in my head. Uh, But those are at least 10 players that you guys voted on as being your favorite picks this season. We're going to do this exact same video. So if you want to do it now, I'll give other shout outs. If you want to put in the comment section, follow the same format as before. Who are your least favorite picks this season? Give me a quarterback, a running back, a wide receiver, and a tight end. And then give me your overall, which is worst pick. I'm not talking about like players who are ranked in the 300s. I'm saying given someone's ADP, who do you think is a bad pick? Who's going in the second round that should be a fourth round pick? Who's going in the fifth round that should be a ninth round pick? Like who is just being way too overvalued this season in your opinion? Of course, you're scrolling through the comment section you see some responses you really like, well, leave a like, you know, leave a like, give them some extra votes. And I want to say maybe a week uh, or so, we'll go over your responses to that. Also remember, if you want to see my must-own players, you want to see my favorite picks, where I have everyone ranked across every single scoring format, you can always check that out at our website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com. But that, my friends, is the end of this one. I hope you all to enjoy if you did. But how about hitting the like button? And how about subscribing to the channel if you're new here? Thanks for watching.